Hi, this is James Weatherly. Thank you for joining me. This video is about the golden era of flying. 1950s, four engine, pressurized, piston airliners flying coast to coast in the United States. But on June the 30th, 1956, something happened. This horrible midair that you see behind me that changed the way we fly even today. You're going to be fascinated as you walk through the steps leading up to this crash and the change of the way we fly. Thanks for joining me today. Miami departure, Sovereign 382 Sierra Charlie out of 1700 for leveling 2000, heading 090. 382 Sierra Charlie, Miami departures, radar contact, climb maintain 5000. Okay, climb maintain 5000 to Sierra Charlie. Those words you just heard from the Miami Departure Control radar contact were very unfamiliar words in the 1950s. Radar was pretty limited. So when you went on a flight coast to coast, the system was overloaded in the 1950s and the general public was not aware of it at all. I want to take you to June the 30th, 1956, when two flights departed LAX, Los Angeles. The first flight was United 718, a DC-7 departing for Chicago, and the second flight was TWA number two departing for Kansas City in a Lockheed constellation. The events that transpired are known, and I have used the Civil Aeronautics Board Accident Report to take you back to the events of June the 30th, 1956. What you see now is a map that was attached to the CAB, that's abbreviation for Civil Aeronautics Board, the predecessor of the FAA, their accident investigation. Los Angeles is on the left and then a little bit uh, way uh, about a third of the way is Las Vegas, and then the rest of it you're heading in routes that go eastbound to the Midwest and the East Coast of the United States. Still a lot of these routes are roughly the same today. Let's look at the first airliner, which is United Flight 718. He filed out of Los Angeles over to Palm Springs. I've flown that route before. And then his next route would be heading to the Needles VOR, and then on a fairly direct route up into Chicago, arriving over the Joliet VOR. It's a normal route that uh, still is used today. Now, the next thing we'll see is what happened to TWA Flight 2. They also filed a departure route out of Los Angeles. Their initial routing was an airway airway number five to the Daggett VORs, just north of Palm Springs and again still in use today. After Daggett, they had requested direct to Trinidad, uh, Colorado. There was a beacon there, it's no longer there, uh, but that was the routing that they would do. And then from there, they're going to Dodge City and right on into Kansas City. Now, as you notice this route, notice what happens on this filed route. <laughs> There's a problem down the road. The routes cross over each other. So that's not a problem as long as you're at different altitudes. Now, one of the important things we'll look at is there was a reporting point here. Uh, this yellow line signifies the reported point, uh, which is not really a point, but actually a line between two VORs called the Painted Desert. Passing the Painted Desert meant to the controllers, hey, this aircraft is passing the general area of the Grand Canyon. Before we proceed to the catastrophic events that would result from this routing, I want to share four critical items. First of all, there was no widespread use of radar. Radar at this time in the 1950s was only in the terminal area, like around the big airports. En route, there was no radar. The controller could not see you. If that wasn't enough, in the 1950s, the pilots did not talk to the controllers. Unbelievable. They talked through radio operators. 
This is still used in certain parts of the world, and older pilots like myself remember doing that. You would call the radio operator with your call sign, give him your request. He would say, stand by, via landline, teletype, however. He would call the controller. The controller would check on your request, then call him back, being the radio operator, tell him, okay, that's okay. Then the radio operator had to call you. There was an obvious lag in that system. Number three, there were huge areas of uncontrolled airspace. That means a place where the controller does not separate aircraft flying from each other. The major area after Los Angeles where they were traveling the direct routes over the Grand Canyon was uncontrolled airspace at that time. And finally, a common way to separate traffic was the see and avoid method. That meant the pilots had to see the other airplanes and simply avoid them visually. So think about those four factors. They'll play a big factor in this catastrophe. The first change of event happens at 921. TWA Flight 2 has climbed to 19,000 feet, but is unable to get clear of the clouds. So the captain is going to request the next altitude, which would be 21,000 feet. Since TWA is out of range of direct communication with the Los Angeles Air Traffic Control System, he simply calls his company radio operator in a call that would sound like this. TWA Ops, TWA Ops, TWA Flight 2, position and request. TWA Flight 2, this is TWA Operations, go ahead. Roger, TWA Flight 2, we are approaching position Daggett at time 0921. We're maintaining 19,000 feet. Request, request, climb and maintain 21,000 feet. Over. Roger, TWA-2, TWA Operations copies, approaching Daggett 0921, requesting climb to 21,000 feet, stand by. With the answer stand by, the TWA operator calls Los Angeles Air Traffic Control to see if that request would be granted. The controller sees a potential conflict, so he says, no, we will not authorize climb to 21,000 feet. But the problem is they're entering uncontrolled airspace, so the controller cannot force the airplane to stay there. So this is the next transmission. TWA Flight 2, TWA Ops. Roger, uh, TWA Ops, this is TWA Flight 2. Go ahead. Be advised, be advised. Los Angeles Air Traffic Control advises maintain, maintain 19,000, unable 21,000 feet. Over. At this point, there's a quick discussion in the cockpit, and the captain makes a decision. It sounds like this. Roger, understand unable 21,000, advise, advise Los Angeles, TWA Flight 2 now climbing and maintaining 1,000 feet VFR on top for 21,000 feet. Over. Roger, will advise. That's the end of that transmission because the captain has just told the operator to tell the controller he's going to climb to 21,000 anyway and visually look for other aircraft. The next position report that TWA-2 would make would also be through a radio operator at Las Vegas. Here's the next position report, which will be the final position report that TWA-2 will make. It sounds like this. TWA Las Vegas, TWA Las Vegas, TWA-2 position, over. Roger, TWA-2. Two, this is Las Vegas. Go ahead with position. Roger, TWA-2, 
to Chicks uh, position, uh, Lake Mojave at 0955. We are VFR on top, maintaining 21,000 feet. Estimated painted desert at 1031. Farmington next. Go ahead. Roger. Las Vegas copies TWA2 at Lake Mojave 0955. VFR on top, maintaining 21,000 feet. An estimated painting desert at 1031. Farmington Ness will pass the message to Los Angeles. Good day. Now, that's the end of that transmission, but I want you to very carefully remember that painted desert estimate at 1031 because we're going to find that estimate will be in conflict with United 718's estimate for the Painted Desert. They will be identical. Both airplanes estimating Painted Desert crossing routes at 1031 and they were at 21,000 feet. No one is there to stop or warn them because they are in uncontrolled airspace. United 718, the DC-7 flying the southern portion of the initial routing, did make its normal position reports via aeronautical radio as normal, passing Riverside, California, and then passing Palm Springs. As they approached the Needles VOR, they made what would be their last position report. This technique here is different than talking to a radio station. You actually talk to a radio operator and listen to his response over the VOR frequency, in this case, Needles VOR. At 9.58 in the morning, United 718 calling Prescott Radio. Prescott Radio, Prescott Radio, United 718 positions listening at Needles VOR. Roger, United 718, Prescott Radio, go ahead, over. Prescott Radio, United 718, checks position needles at 0958. We are maintaining 21,000 feet, estimating painted desert at 1031, Durango next, go ahead. Roger, uh, Prescott Radio copies United uh, 718, uh, checking needles at uh, 0958, maintaining 21,000 feet, estimated painted desert at 103 run, Durango next. Good day. Now you stop right there and go, are these guys idiots? Have they lost their mind? Now, two different aircraft have reported through radio operators that they're going to be at the same point and the same altitude at 1031. And they did this more than 30 minutes ahead of time. But you have to remember, there's no direct contact. There's no requirement to maintain a direct radio contact. That was a complete systems failure, which came out as a result of the accident. Things happen a lot slower. This was at the time of satellite communication internet. And the accident was already welded in stone 30 minutes ahead of time. The only thing that could prevent the collision now was the see and avoid principle, where pilots simply looking out of their rather small windshield may see the other airliner and avoid it. Nobody knows for sure, but there were buildups of clouds in the Grand Canyon area. This may have added to the limited visibility issue, but at exactly 1031, the TWA Flight 2 constellation struck the United 718 DC-7 in mid-flight exactly over the Grand Canyon and 128 people fell to their death, knowing what was happening in an awful crash into the side of the canyon. The only signal was at seven seconds before 
10.31, there was a radio transmission picked up. Salt Lake, United 718, we're going in. The radio operators were expecting a position report from both aircraft at 10.31 over the Painted Desert. That did not occur. One hour and 20 minutes later, at 11.51, the CAA activated its missing aircraft protocol since both aircraft had missed their reporting points. It was not until very late in the evening till some people had spotted the wreckage, and actually, July the 1st, the wreckage was confirmed. Air Force helicopters proceeded to the area in what was perceived a rescue mission. But very quickly it became totally apparent there was no rescue mission, only a recovery. Then, as usual, politicians and other people proceeded to the area. It was absolutely horrid. The site would continue to attract people for many years. In September 1957, the Grand Canyon Park Service actually closed that section to move parts of the wreckage so that people would not stop on their river raft trips and go and look at it. And eventually in 1976, a great deal of the wreckage was removed and pulled out. It came down to the fact that they were only able to identify uh, approximately 29 people from the United flight, because it had not gone straight in, and only four remains were identified from the TWA flight. They created a mass grave in Flagstaff, Arizona, and the funeral took place on July the 4th, 1956. This whole event shocked the nation to its core. This is the first time in history that more than 100 people had been killed in an aviation accident. 128 lives were lost in an instant. Of course, there would be an investigation by the Civil Aeronautics Board when they interviewed the CAA air traffic controllers and the head of the Air Traffic Control Division, they said, nothing went wrong. We followed the procedures that were in effect, which was actually a correct statement, but the system was broken. The Airline Pilots Association, the Pilots Union, spoke out vocally against the Civil Aeronautics Board, stating that the rules and regulations were archaic and unsafe. The cockpit windows would not allow for pilots to maintain visual separation. President Eisenhower commissioned a study in 1957 to begin to examine what changes need to be made. It was noted in the study that there was only one long-range radar in existence and it extended 100 nautical miles. All airliners were flying without the benefit of radar contact and separation. Also, there were only 375 VOR navigational aids. Because of that limited number, airlines had to constantly fly off airway direct routes, which frequently brought them into uncontrolled airspace. Well, if that wasn't enough, finally, tragedy struck again. In April and May of 1958, two different mid-airs occurred over the United States. That was enough. Two days after the second mid-air, legislation was introduced and on August the 23rd, 1958, President Eisenhower signed into law the Federal Aviation Administration Act. For pilots like myself, who operate under the FAA, yeah, we often make some jokes about it, but this was a major change. Here's some of the changes. First of all, there would be no more flying VFR on top. That was the end of it during high altitude flight. Secondly, if you flew above 18,000 feet over the United States, there would be a new zone called the positive control zone. 
for new pilots, they'd call it the Class A airspace. It simply meant if you flew above 18,000 feet, you had to be on an instrument flight plan, you had to talk with air traffic control, and they had to separate you from other aircraft. Thirdly, the number of VORs would be doubled immediately to reduce off-airway routing, and eventually they would triple. Finally, there was federal funding for 82 long-range air traffic control radars that would allow the controllers to see airplanes at great distance and separate them. All that seems commonplace today. When you take off in a jet airplane, you can relax. You're going to hear those words, radar contact, if you're a pilot. If you're a pastor, you know that somebody is watching you and separating you from other aircraft. And that is the way we fly today as a result of that horrific 1956 crash over the Grand Canyon. I hope you enjoyed that video. For those of you who might like to learn more, I have put together a special resource on my website. You'll see it on the right side of the page where it says learn more about the 1956 crash. Click on it, take you to a ton of links and resources about that horrible accident. Also, I'd really appreciate if you'd make some comments and let me know what you think about this video. It takes me a ton of time to research and assemble these videos. If you don't tell me you like them, I won't know what to do. And if you tell me they're horrible, let me know. I won't spend time making these kind of videos anymore. Also, I'd love for you to join my family of subscribers. So you'll get a heads up on all videos, not a bunch of nuisance. Uh, spams and emails. I hate those, but you're going to get a heads up about videos. And for doing that and joining my family, you're going to get my free ebook coming out this fall. Just look on the right side of the video and click on that. That'll take you where you can sign up. Also, I'm showing you on the right side another playlist of all different JTW Pilot Channel videos for your pleasure to learn more about the videos that I've produced over the last several years. Lastly, on the lower right hand portion of the screen, you can click on it and subscribe. Always subscribe to a channel that gives you immediate notice of any videos when they come out. Thanks a bunch. I appreciate you being part of my followers. Have a great day.